Hi, this is KP Yohannan, President of Gospel for Asia. If I could, I would love to take you with me to the mission fields of Asia. There you would see firsthand how God is moving in unbelievable ways to bring thousands of lost people into his kingdom. But since that is not possible, I want to do the next best thing. I want to bring the mission fields to you. That is why we are hosting our second annual Renewing Your Passion Conference. It is in Texas this summer, close to the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. I encourage you to set aside June 30th to July 2nd for an experience that can change your life. So, mark your calendar and join me for our Renewing Your Passion Conference, June 30th through July 2nd. It will be an experience you will never forget. Complete information and registration is available through our website at gospelforasia.org. That's gospelforasia.org. Or call us, 866-WIN-ASIA. That's 866-WIN-ASIA. Let me ask you, what does authentic, effective missions look like? The answer is wonderfully simple. Welcome to The Road to Reality with Brother K.P. Yohannan, the President of Gospel for Asia. Today, we're going to bring you a message simply entitled, Authentic Missions, What Does It Look Like? In a look at the Gospel of Matthew, Brother K.P. is examining the approach we all need to take to missions. And it is the simple approach Jesus describes. So Brother K.P. will look at the words of Jesus in relation to missions. And if you're not aware of the mission of Gospel for Asia, it is to support native missionaries to go into all the regions of India to share the good news of Jesus. You can find out more through our website at gospelforasia.org. And now, here's Brother K.P. to examine Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20 on this edition of The Road to Reality. Authentic Missions. What does it look like? What a title. I wonder if Jesus gave any plan to his disciples about world evangelism. At least I don't read that in the four Gospels. It's strange, isn't it? You know, parents, the last thing they worry about, if they know they're going to die, they write out their will, you know, this for this, this for this, and all those things. And the last thing they do is trying to give some plans and ideas about running the business and what to do, what not to do, and all these different things. But as far as Jesus is concerned, he who came to live on earth and to die on the cross to save the world, the final hours of his time, he is not talking about any agenda, you know, global mapping, computer printouts, strategies, World ABC, which is good, you know. As a matter of fact, I get so much material about mission, different agendas, angles, hardly any time to open those envelopes. There are thousands and thousands of books released on every conceivable angle ideas about world evangelism. People group this, that, all this. And in the end, end, you get so confused, you don't know what to do with any of those things. And I look at Jesus. He said, Lord, it's a real bummer that you didn't tell any of these fellows what to do. As a matter of fact, if you take John's Gospel, chapter 1 to 21, chapter 1 to 12 is the description of three and a half years of his life. But chapter 13 to 21, so much of that Gospel is the last few hours of his life. And at least there he should talk about world evangelism. But nothing is there. He simply says, if you love one another, everybody will know. He washed their feast. And he will not forget Peter who failed. He goes after this fellow who denied him. It, it's, it's amazing how simple and touchable it is, the plan of God. Now, I've been serving God. If you want to call it professional mission world um, from the age of 16. Now I am 21. <laughs> now it's been a, a long journey. And when you think about world mission, reaching the lost world, things can become so complicated. In the end, we run into a fog 
that we can't see things clearly, so confused like you're on drug. It's like, you know, the place I was born and raised in extreme southern part of India by a river. I, I never can forget this. Of course, you know, the place I grew up, you know, uh, when people ask me to describe it, I say, you had to go and find the oldest Tarzan black and white movie you can find. And it's no electricity, no gas, no car, no bicycle, nothing. Just extremely primitive. And it's a beautiful river in front of my house. So in the morning time, morning hours, you know, before you go to school, we kids will climb on the cork and tree which is leaning uh, toward the river. And we would just climb on those little cork and trees and jump into the river and swim. It's crystal clear, beautiful water. You can see fish swimming all over the place. It's deep river. But quite nice. But years went by. Today you go to the river. You don't want to even wash your hand in the river. It is so polluted. The DDT. And the pesticide. And the dirt and the muck. That people poured into the river from both sides. Just ruined it. Some ways church and missions also is like that. For 2000 years man has Come up with his own ideas and plans based on the medicine, obviously, techniques and tricks and business practices, whatever, and figured out two plus two is four, therefore it must work like this. But God's ways are totally different. And they pumped all the stuff into this thing, and then the whole river is polluted. Do we really want to know what God is all about? What He's saying about His people and the world, His plan? Let's go back to the beginning of the beginning of the river. The foothills of the mountain where it starts. This is where Bible becomes our sole authority and the only source book. And God never changes. His word never changes. It is settled forever. Let's call every man a liar. Let God be true. If we can go back to scripture again and again and again and embrace the simplicity of his instruction, we are better off. And this is what I have to do often in my life when I do not know what to do. I run the scripture and say, is anything in it that talks about it? You know, I think about Thomas. People call him Doubting Thomas. I mean, he was a great leader, one of the apostles of our Lord. I wonder who ever told him to go to India. Did you know he came to India? He came to India in AD 52. When I was studying in seminary here, there was a huge thick book about um, church history and another book on ancient history. And I was reading through it. I was astounded. Right there in that book, the name of my village was mentioned, Niranam. N-I-R-A-N-A-M. I said, I can't believe it. I'm here. It was there because they talked about Thomas, Christ's disciple, as an apostle missionary coming to India, and one of the places he came to preach, it was my village. He planted seven churches, and one of the churches happened to be three kilometers from where I was born and raised. You know what? That makes me a better Christian. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, can you imagine this fellow came there, and I, I surely did not think he learned my native language, because I don't think any human being can possibly understand my native language. <laughs> But how come he planted those churches in the darkest heathen region? Who gave him the plan? What was it that made it work? What was it that Hudson Taylor went to China? He realized he needed to give up all his stuff and become a Chinese and do the work. What, what, what plan? As a matter of fact, the mission agency sent him, rejected him, said, this fellow is nutcase. He lost his brains and wouldn't support him. What made William Carey... You know, who was a cobbler comes to India and became the father of missions. And his church people said, you young fellow, sit down here. If God wants to save the heathens, he'll find somebody else better than you. What was it? What plan was that? Well, these kind of things makes us really want not to wander away and go after all the thousand things happening all over the place about missions. Rather, say, Lord, what is it? The, how your Holy Spirit worked? From day one, Lord, teach me your ways. But my brothers and sisters, somehow it is good for us. Um, as we think about missions or 
fulfilling the Lord's call upon our life to reach the lost world. Look at also the scripture and say what the scripture says. With that, let's read a bunch of verses, okay? I, I got about two hours worth of Bible verses. Uh, but um, uh, we will begin with Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28, very famous scripture portion. This is the classic uh, scripture portion for world evangelism, as you know. Then Jesus came to them and said, Matthew's Gospel 28, verse 18 to 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Verse 20. And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the end of the age. Mark chapter 16, verse 15 and 16. He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel or good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. If you don't want to turn to this verse, it's fine, because I, I got it printed out, so you know, I'm not a superman turning my pages here. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. Colossians chapter 1, verse 24 to 29. Paul speaks here. (laughs) Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you and fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present you the word of God in its fullness. 26. The mystery, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. All missions will have as its focus the message of Jesus Christ. This is The Road to Reality with Brother K.P. Yohannan, the president of Gospel for Asia. Now, K.P. will be back in just a few moments with the conclusion of this study, simply entitled Authentic Missions, What Does It Look Like? We'd like to send you a free copy of Brother K.P.'s popular book. It's called Revolution in World Missions. Simply visit our website at gospelforasia.org or call us at 866 866- Win Asia. We'd love to send you a copy. And now, as we return to Brother K.P. Yohannan, he'll continue to talk about authentic missions. And he'll take us to a few more verses that help to clarify God's purpose in missions. Here's Brother K.P. to read Ephesians chapter 3 at verse 1. Ephesians chapter 3, beginning the verse 1. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is, the mystery made known to me by revelation. And I have already written briefly regarding this. Then you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to men in other generations as it is now being revealed by the Spirit of God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles and heirs together with Israel, members together of one body and shares together in the promise in Christ Jesus. Verse 10, his intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Just one more verse. Second Timothy 2.10 Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. 
Just one more verse. <laughs> Ephesians 5.32 This is a profound mystery. But I am talking about Christ and the church. What is mission work? What is this anyway? What is the purpose of it? I think if you take the whole Bible, the 66 books, you divide that into two parts. The Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament is the account of a nation. And the New Testament is the account of a man. Christ Jesus. The nation he called for the purpose of bringing about a man, the Son of God, the Messiah. That's the whole Bible. But then, one more question needs to be asked, maybe several more. What is the purpose of Christ coming into the world? The answer, you know, he came to die and to rise again. I mean, you, you now Bible words are floating through your head like a computer screen scrolling, I'm sure. John 3.16 and all kind of Bible verses. And when he died, according to First John chapter 2 verse 12, his death paid for the sin of the whole world. Am I right? From Adam to the last individual. None should perish. God wants. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of 10,000 people. The whole world. Yet, not all will enter into this narrow road. Broad is the way. If God knew from all eternity that the death of Christ and his resurrection will not result in the salvation of the whole world for which he died and paid the price. What was he thinking? Please think about it. I submit to you, God who knows all things from eternity past, he knew, he saw the choices man will make. And he saw only a minority, a small group, will respond. And that small group became the object of all God's plans and provisions and creation and purpose and everything. It was for them that he created the universe. It was for them he created the earth. It was to find that small group of people he created man. It was for, it was for this he entered into the human race and was born as a man. And this group is called the church. His body. Go further. Not just church. The bride. Of the lamb. You can read Bible verses. Matthew 16, 18. Revelation 21 verse 9. And on like that. Now using the. The conclusive argument. Or residual argument. That is. If you want to know the meaning. And purpose of history or an action, you must look at the end result, the final outcome, the net result. Prophecy is the history written at advance. Am I right? When you read prophecy, it is history written in advance. We have history's final chapter. You know where it is? In the book of Revelation. The closing pages. That is, God the Father decided 
way back in eternity, which he would not tell anyone, a mystery hidden in the heart of the Father, that someday he is going to have a creation, this earth, Adam, mankind. What will happen? But through all this, to find the eternal companion for his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. A bride spotless, without blemish and sin. To be with him, to reign with him forever and ever. The heavenly bridegroom upon a throne of the universe, ruling and reigning with him over an ever increasing and expanding kingdom. He came for this one purpose, to claim his beloved. Revelation chapter 19, verse 6 and 9, chapter 21, verse 7, 9 and 10. Thus, the church and only the church is the key to the explanation of history. You look at all the Bible history and secular history and whatever, really, when you really look at it, there's no such thing as secular history. It's God sitting in heaven saying, oh, I don't know what to do. Hitler is doing this and what you know, I mean, Nero is doing is I'm in big trouble. Can you just imagine scientists now with this weird telescope, Hubble scope, whatever, they discovered there are billions of galaxies out there somewhere. Even after another 100,000 million light years, the light of those stars will never reach here. How great, how awesome is this almighty. You think Satan who was defeated, destroyed, the key taken away, squashed, finished, all the stupid things the devil is doing, God is saying, I just can't believe he's doing to me again. I tell you, it is a choice God made to give freedom to Satan and all the demons. To help his bride to get ready through trials and tests. To qualify herself. To become holy. To reign with him forever and ever. You will never become holy without temptation. And opposition. So when you talk about mission... What are we all talking about? To me, it's very simple. Why it is so simple? Because I see the disciples of Christ. You know, I mean, if I were Christ, I'm so glad I am not. When I come on the scene, I will, I will go and recruit the, the, the smartest theologians of the day to promote my case. The high priest and the lawyers and Sadducees and, and all the smart brains and politicians. The only smart person he picked was Judas. He's the only fellow who was born on the right side of the track. Who knew how to count money. And he's the one who betrayed our Lord. And Peter and a whole bunch of them. They're just normal, simple, little human beings. Who didn't know a whole bunch? But I tell you one thing. Acts 17.6 These, those who turn the world upside down have come here also. In Philip's translation, these world revolutionaries have come here also. It was not the oratory. It was not the unbelievable words that nobody can figure out what they're talking about. It was not their money or power or good look. No, it was the way of life. Well, true effective missions is the result of genuine Christians living for Christ and carrying out his message of love as a normal part of their lives. It's so tough to break away from this message, but we'll bring you the second half on our next program. You've been listening to The Road to Reality with Brother K.P. Yohannan, the president of Gospel for Asia. And we've been listening to a message from Brother K.P. entitled Authentic Missions, What Does It Look Like? 
And by the way, coming up in Dallas, June 30th through July 2nd, we're having the second Renewing Your Passion Conference. Brother KP and Native Mission Leaders will bring the mission field to you. And you'll hear firsthand accounts about God's grace and the realities of missions work. So come and join us in Dallas. Now, it would be easy to consider Gospel for Asia's Renewing Your Passion Missions Conference to be, well, just another meeting. To let you know how strongly Brother KP feels about the Renewing Your Passion Conference, if it's not a blessing to you, he'll give you back the cost of your conference registration and Gaylord Hotel Room. No questions asked. So come and join us in Dallas. Complete information and registration is available through our website at gospelforasia.org. And that's gospelforasia.org. Or call us, 866-WIN-ASIA. That's 866-WIN-ASIA. Thank you for listening to Road to Reality, the radio ministry of Gospel for Asia. 